It's time! <laughs> the Apologise to Me podcast, episode seven. My name is Martin Devlin. I work for the platform in New Zealand and with me, the one, the only, Mark Watson, who joins us. What I welcome. How are you, Martin? You're looking I'm very... Good, you, 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 you're not one of these people like the rest of the country that have suddenly believe everything's all good in the world of the All Blacks, that we're on track and going to win the World Cup. And how dare you, how dare you have criticised the All Blacks previous to this test match to Argentina. And how dare you have criticised Sam Kane because they've proven us all wrong, Martin. You're not one of those, are you? You know I'm one of those. And that's the first topic we're going to talk about is the All Blacks are back after beating Argentina. We have a one-day cricket series starting today in Cairns of all places, the Chapel Hadley, okay. Uh, the Warriors, <sighs> let's talk about the Warriors and wrap the season up. VAR rulings in the football, Watto, and also the K-Gun Kyrgios is going to win the US Open. I will call that now. Apologise to me! But kicking it off with Argentina. Oh, sorry, mate. Just, well, you, the you mentioned the Warriors. The problem that people like asleep. you have, and, and this is no personal disrespect to you, but the, per, the problem that people like you have is an inability to isolate and celebrate a victory that was absolutely magnificent. Now, I don't for a second think, in all honesty, that the All Blacks are back. And I know that we are terribly inconsistent. We have still lost six of eight prior to that. But in Hamilton on Saturday night, under those conditions against that team, we played really well. <laughs> and you've got to acknowledge that. that you've got team, to come to that, that party. Team, that team. Name me your back line for that team. Tell me, run through the Argentinian lineup because it's so well known because it's such world class. Tell me the last time, Martin, that Argentina put two world class performances back to back week after week. Historically, they haven't done it. The All Blacks were always going to go and win that test match. Okay, they're always going to go and win that test match. Isn't it funny now how we're using Argentina as a benchmark to see whether the All Blacks are any good? We've lost twice to them in our history, both under Ian Foster, both in the last two years. But now, if we can beat Argentina, apparently everything is all okay. okay, okay well, no, is no, it, no, Martin, this and is I the don't... counter to your argument, and this is an easy counter to your argument. If we beat South Africa, we use that as a yardstick. Who have South Africa lost to this year? They've lost at home to Wales in a historic first ever at home upset. They got pink again by Australia in Australia and last weekend was the first time they'd won there since Moses played number 10 for Mount Sinai mate. They've lost to us at Joburg. They're not the yardstick. Australia aren't the yardstick. Argentina aren't the yardstick. We don't know who the yardstick is at the moment. We're all assuming it's the big boogie yeah, man up yeah, north. Yeah. Oh it's England and it's France. But all we can do is play who is in front of us yeah, mate. But we have lost two tests to Ireland. We've lost a test to Argentina. We've lost a test to South Africa. We lost last year in France. We lost last year in Ireland. And then suddenly I'm made to believe and I should be celebrating a victory over Argentina yes. on the weekend. Yes. And you know what also frustrates me? I picked up an article yesterday. I saw the article headline, Sir John Kerwin made to eat humble pie for his comments that he had made last week on Sam Kane. He wanted Sam Kane to be rested or dropped based on form or based on the fact whether he's actually good enough or not. He shouldn't have to eat humble pie. I, I can't stand these cowards. What kind of what, no, I can't stand these that? Why read cowards wise after the fact who actually don't say anything at the time but wait until after the game before they have an opinion. Sir John Kerwin, the likes of myself, everybody shared that same opinion. And for a lot of us, we still share that same opinion. Sam Cain is no different than the All Blacks. Is Sam Kane suddenly our, our, our great number seven? The great number sevens, go through them. So if you go and have you, you go and have a look at the great Michael Jones, um, you go and look at Richie McCaw, um, Josh Cromfeld, they weren't good one in every six tests. They were good for six tests out sure, of six absolutely. tests. Absolutely. And so suddenly I'm made to believe Sam Kane is now back. He's proven us all wrong. And how dare we have criticised him. No, I disagree. Well, what, I how totally how just, moronic, how just, moronic okay, is that, the media? But, that, no, but that's, that's just the cheesy millennial view. And that's that's where the, the 12-year-old who goes to these press conferences, as I keep harping on about, with no historical knowledge or perspective, that's what we get these days from our news hubs and our TV and Zs and our mass media newspapers. That's what we get. I mean, I don't read any of that stuff. I actually go outside of that stuff. And I think it's really important in this particular case just to say when a team and any team that you support 
is is suffering, is on a, is on a losing trot and everything else. When they turn around and have a good game, it's the same as my Man United side. I don't think that all of a sudden we're resurrected and after beating Arsenal that all of a sudden we're a title winning side or even a top four side. But I'll celebrate that particular win because on that day we played well. That doesn't mean anything other than on that day we played well. And hey, this is what you've got to get your head around. That that's where the All Blacks are at at the moment. The All Blacks are not a team mark that from now on wins 10 test matches in a row. We're not that good and these players aren't that good. And I hope I eat humble pie at the end of the World Cup next year because these players proved me wrong. But at the moment, they've proven nothing to me other than they played really well against Argentina. They played really well in Joburg. But in between those two, they played like mud again, like they did against Ireland and in France last year. But at least the sun shines on a Sunday morning, Mark, when you get up. And I know you accuse Steve, Steve Hansen of this as saying, the sun might bloody shine, but apologise to me. Mate, just enjoy the win. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Just enjoy the Two win. Two Bledisloe Cup matches to come. Yep. And then we've got to go and play Wales, Scotland and England. Yes. We win the five tests and then I will start to wake up and go, the sun is shining, So Martin. what, you're just assuming, Japan, then, you're assuming that we beat Japan? No, we'll, we'll put a second string well, side why, out against well, the why Japanese. Why would we do that though, Mark? This is what frustrates the hell out of me. Why? Would, why and we all know this is going to happen, right? We're going to play two Bledisloe Cup tests. And then we're going to go to Japan and we're going to play a second string team. Stephen Perifetta at first five. Roger you know, Tuivasa Shek at se- second, second five. five you know, absolutely uh, no. Chris Bra- will start the game. Bra- Braden N will probably at yeah, centre. You know. We'll put a whole lot of and then, second stringers And then the first match against Scotland, we're going to stutter and stumble again because this team not hasn't ready. played. Yep. So explain all this to me. And this is the whole Roger Tuivasa. The PowerPoint presentation mentality well, I keep the, referring to. This is the RTS to. argument that I have. We're Ian Foster last week. We'll swap subjects on this, but this is actually all part of the same thing, people. Roger Tuivasa Shek, who Ian Foster said last week, and it's having the biggest learnings is actually going to the breakdown when the team is attacking and what to do, what your instinct does, what your default mecha- mechanism does, right? So how on earth do you learn how to do that unless you're playing games of rugby? Training is not rugby. Training is training. You can train as many times as you like, but in the heat of a game, it's actually different. The ball might not roll mm. out the side exactly like that. The, the guy next to you isn't actually going to go, oh, hang on a second, that didn't quite work. Let's do it again. Roger should be playing Every weekend that he's not playing no, for the All Blacks. But this is what I'm saying. Now, we had a little discussion earlier before coming on air. You go back. Super Rugby final was July 18th. How much rugby has Stephen Perifeta played since then? 50-second token All Black jersey. Roger Tuivasa checked 10 minutes against Ireland in the third test. They released him for part of a game against Auckland, and I think they've finally Northern, released him yep. now. Then you go Sevu Reese, best player in Super Rugby. I think he started maybe in their first All Black game or possibly the first two. We haven't seen him since. They list. They finally let Lester Fayanganuku play on the weekend. Look, name your team on Tuesday and then release the rest of your players to go and play in the MPC or go and play at least some club rugby. I keep talking about it. This is what is the problem with New Zealand rugby. You, you, you know, you've sat there, you've sort of said, hey, we're no longer going to win t- 10 test matches no, in a row. No, it's not. all changed. Part of that is because... Do we have the playing talent? Do we no. have the hardness? No, because, as I've said, we've eroded the other forms of the game. And this is a great example of it. You can't tell me that 200 extra people, I think 200 people would turn up around the country to watch Ru- Roger Tuivasa Sheik playing for Auckland. Yeah, they would. And, okay, so people might go, let's say it's $20 a ticket. So that's $4,000 that that union makes. They go, it's only $4,000. Well, go and tell a local club it's only $4,000. And so our professional players are not playing. You don't see it in the NBA. You don't see it in Major League Baseball. You don't see it in the EPL. The England squad are going to suddenly say, oh, guys, we've got a World Cup coming up. Hey, don't play for Liverpool. Don't play for Spurs this week. No, it's, it's ridiculous. Look, it, it, it it's is. Look, and we actually agree on this. Our and players every... don't play, no, Martin. Don't. And look, and here's the lesson in history, is that in 2007, when Graham Henry, who was Graham Henry, not Sir Graham Henry at that stage, introduced rest and rotation... And effectively, we sent an all-black side to the gym. We got to the World Cup. They hadn't actually mm. played any rugby. And when it came to it, all of a sudden, you know, you know, when you're pounding the gym equipment, it doesn't bite you back. It doesn't knee you in the nuts. It, it doesn't d- pull your ear on while you're playing. And none of our guys could handle it. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, my God, we're dropping balls yeah. in games because we're not used to actually playing. But it's, it's uh, absolutely uh, but insane. This is, what, this is when you bring too many coaches in. You bring too many sort of um, sports, sports science brains. guys in. And I as I keep saying, it's the PowerPoint presentation. But just going back to that, I always remember. So if you go back to, say, 2004, most of our All Blacks played Super Rugby and then played a fair bit of the MPC. Yeah, and then right. went on the end of the year, too. We had record victories against France. We actually and won, we won everything, slam, didn't we? And then in 2005, we did the similar thing. No, and we had brilliant, yeah. brilliant end of the year tours. Yeah. And so we actually had a blueprint in place for success. And then come 2007, 
Oh, we no, need no. to rest. Right, you rest see it a lot at the Olympic Games. Athletes go to the Olympic Games and they're favourites. And they thinly they think, oh, it's Olympic year. So what's the biggest mistake they can make? They actually change what they're That's doing right, in they, Olympic they year. They don't do any events. They just, they just and, turn up at and the they Olympics change, without racing. And they yeah. change everything in Olympic year because they think they have to. There's a reason why you're the favourite. There's a reason why you've got it right. It's called a formula. 2011, the best two players at the World Cup that year for New Zealand Jerome were Jerome Kaino and Kevin Mialamu. And if you go back and actually look at the seasons they had, they played more games that year than any other All Black, and they carried that momentum in. Yeah, but it's all changed. You don't understand. You're an old fogey, mate. You're you're a boomer like me. You don't understand these days. You don't have to play. Well, of course they're tired, Mark. They're constantly like how when you're sitting there on your Instagram for seven hours a night after you've scored a try, answering all your fans. Of course you're tired, mate. Takalahi, who's been our best player for the All Blacks, he must be shattered this week because he got to play sixty well, minutes. Explain this to sixty me. minutes. Explain. I mean, the, you know, you can't. A t- beekeeper climbed to the top of Mount Everest, walked around the corner, and said, "I knocked the bastard off." But no, 44 minutes will pull our front row because yeah, they're yeah, no. so tired. We're, go, we're going to get to 23,000 feet, and we're going to actually, those guys have missed the expedition now because we are tired. Okay, call it the bledders though before next Thursday, okay, because we'll be talking before next Thursday, and I'll ask you the same question next week. What is going to happen? Are we splitting the series like every other series in the rugby championship, or do we win this 2-0, or do we lose this 2-0? I think it's one all. I, I, think, think, I think we're dropping one I of these I think tests. we split the series. Yeah which will just prove my earlier point, don't get too carried away with what happened against Argentina on Saturday night. Okay, the other thing is, of course, is that New Zealand rugby, in all of their wisdom, gets gets together with Australian rugby and whoever else. I don't even know if Sanzar exists. Let's take a test to Melbourne because we're spreading the global game and we're, we're creating new revenue streams and earning new market opportunities. And in Melbourne, they'd rather watch their club AFL sides play at at the biggest stadium this weekend. So we get relegated to a Thursday night. The biggest brand in world rugby gets relegated the three and a half billion dollar brand because of club football in Melbourne how embarrassing is this for the New Zealand yeah, rugby union what have you not learnt they had that super rugby weekend in Melbourne where they had four of the, every super rugby round was played in Melbourne and no one turned up no one turned and up. no, one, no watched one watched it, it. No. but this is the mentality it's like guys what part of this don't you get here well of course here? they don't get it because they made they, they, all they're doing is they're going off yet more focus groups people in committee rooms sitting around uh, ask, asking the same questions to the same people and getting the same nodding response. And I've been in these meetings, mate. If you sit there and you're the person who puts your hand up and you say, hey, uh, the emperor has no clothes on, you're negative. You're Mr. Negative. You don't get asked back again. Uh, look, it is, it is farcical. We know it. And we have to keep hey, banging a drum because bought- no one else is. Apologise to me. Swap to the Warriors subject here. And this oh, is, this is a big point for me. Because, you know, I was reading an article the other day on News Hub. And this is the millennial journalists or so-called journalists that are these days employed to do sport, Mark, that are sitting there effectively rewriting press releases. That's what they do. This particular article was about how hard done by the Warriors are next year because the NRL won't bring all their games here. Straight out of Planet Cameron's handbook, and obviously he had quoted the CEO of the Warriors, and I'm sitting there reading this going, what part of this don't you get? The NRL don't owe the Warriors a goddamn no. thing. They have funded them solely for the last two and a half years. They have put them up in resorts on the Gold Coast. They have bent over backwards to keep this load of uselessness club in the competition. We, They don't owe us anything. No, it, we owe them for the fact that they actually haven't cut us loose and given that franchise to another place in Australia that, that would actually deserve it and would actually produce a team that wins more than six games a year. But why a professional franchise is going to give up their home advantage because they're a charity, because they want to thank the Warriors for how tough they've done it over the last two years? I mean, seriously, these and professional let's just franchises. Destroy this narrative. Stop this narrative about how but, tough but they the continue. Warriors have done it. They haven't done it tough. How many other people end up getting transferred overseas? How many other athletes end up getting transferred overseas? How, these people were just absolutely fetid, fated, looked after. They didn't spend a cent, the Warriors, in the last two and a half years. You tell me how many of those Warriors players, Mark, were begging Cameron George, the CEO, to come home. Oh, no, mate. To come home. Yeah. Their families were with them yeah. last year. But, let's not forget that. Well, look, I even go back to 2013. I remember all the excuses we've had, you know. Oh, they sacked Stephen Kearney one year. They've sacked um, our coach this year, um, Brown and Nathan Brown. And, oh, we're living overseas and we're doing it tough. Well, I remember in 2013, they had their coach. They were at home and they still finished 13th. And, yeah. and what Nothing we continue changes. to do, we continue to tell them. We continue to dumb it down. We continue to 
make excuses. They start to buy into it. Yes. You know, once they told everybody that you couldn't run four, sub four minutes for a mile, Roger Bannister goes out, runs f- four minutes. Suddenly, John Landy does it, and then the floodgates open. Everybody else you does it. You can never it. climb Everest. Hillary climbs Everest. To climb Hillary Everest, climbs Everest, shows it can be done, and everybody says it can be done. We've got to stop making excuses for these players. These guys actually need to get a reality check. They actually do need to go and have a look at what some of our other athletes, particularly in individual sports, are doing overseas, where they're there for the right reasons, Martin. They're not even really there doing it because they want necessarily want to make a living out of it. They do it because they're passionate. This is with a childhood dream. They're ambitious. They wake up every day. They want to challenge themselves at the highest level here. You know, I am just sick and tired of the excuses. I'm sick and tired of having this conversation. We've said it before. Oh, yeah, this this is not going to be any different it's not next, be any year. Different next year. It's not going to be any different any in two years' no, time. No, the worries. This is what you are. You have finished. Ninth, eighth, eighth, and and what? Well, no, I'm sorry, wins. Nine, eight, eight, and six in the last and four years. Be patient. You know, I remember a time in New Zealand cricket. I used to have field day on these clowns. You know, they turned it around under McCullum, but it used to be this mantra of potential, 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 followed by retirement. And that's now the moniker I think you can use for the Warriors. Just on the other thing there, I see Sean Johnson comes out and goes, no, I'm not going to retire. My body's feeling good. My mind's feeling good. Well, your body's feeling good because you never put it on the line. <laughs> pretty much. But it's like, Sean, good luck to you. But if you're the Warriors, cut this guy loose. Cut him loose, Move mate. in a different exactly. direction. Exactly, they got away. You don't want him in the trenches. You do not want him. Get rid of Stacey Jones. Not because Stacey's not the right guy. Stacey, go over to Super League. Go and explore the world and develop your coaching. To Tony Iroh and these other backroom staff that have been there forever, go. Just get out. Get out of that industrial site that is Penrose. Change the name of the damn club. Take it somewhere else. But let's just do stuff differently. And Cameron George, you're just so typical of so many national sports organisations here. You're all talk. You're all bravado. You've got all the corporate speak. You sit around in a room. You can sell a a freezer to an Eskimo. We get all of that. But mate, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, in my opinion, you, you guys you are lose. just frauds. It's You're it's frauds, mate. Fraud. And, and for people that still support this club, how dumb are you? Seriously, how well, dumb are you? Well, I'm changing the name of Mount Smart to Mount Stupid now well, because well, after is. that, after that loss to the Titans, I think they have. Oh, to... but fans stick with their team through thick or thin. No, they're ripping you off. They're ripping you off. Okay, great. If you think that's your mentality, phone me. I'm not a plumber, but I'll tell you that I can fix your toilet. (laughs) I'll charge you plumbing rates. And when it all goes to crap, just be loyal to me. Apologise to me. Let us talk cricket. The Chapel Hadley series is... What? It's on. The Chapel Hadley series is on. But once again, it's this is New Zealand rugby organising this. It's in Cairns. It's in Cairns. Now, we've been on the phone to Cairns. We've been trying to find anyone in Australia that even knows this cricket series has started. Down in Brisbane, not a word in any of their press today in their sports pages. Not a word. Townsville, which is only 350k south of Cairns, not a word. In Melbourne, not a word. You have to go scurrying in in the Sydney Morning Herald to find it in about the 10th page of the sports news. There might be a couple of little lines. This is the Chapel Hadley series. We get told by Sky Sport New Zealand Cricket that it's just the ultimate for Australia-New Zealand cricket rivalry. And here it is in September, relegated to Cairns. I mean, stop it. This is what I mean. Just cut out the fluff and the guff and and the the stuff and just just talk truth to us. We're not stupid here. It's it's a real shame because I think the Chapel Hadley, when you look at the the two great families and their place in Australian cricket, New Zealand cricket, I think there was a real opportunity to develop this in time to be something really special, Um, whether it be more of a test match series, a little bit like the Ashes. But you look at the landscape. You look at the landscape. So really what relevance does this have? Are we going to be having a sense of nationalism if we win this series? Probably not. As you say, it's September. It feels like the rugby season. Originally scheduled for March. They've had to reschedule sure, it. I understand. Then I start looking at the T20 situation, which, let's be honest, you watch. It's a bit of entertainment, but you don't wake up going, hey, wow. Can't even remember the last game I we've can't played, even mate. remember the no. last game we've played. No. You've seen the big bash in Australia really struggling with numbers now. Well, that's because they All cocked of our it up top by, players. by doubling the fixtures. And, and, then, and then you come here and go, what does the New Zealand summer look like? And most of the time we play Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh. We don't have the ability to... We don't have that ashes. And I'm just trying to look ahead and go, where does, how does cricket look over the next 10 years? It's a T20 it's sport, all about, It's all about it's the players. It is. It's and the players are going to end up sport. making a lot of money. But we as the fan, 
Are players actually aware of legacy now? Do they realise that no, their place in the game is in Test match I'm cricket? I'm not sure the generation actually that that we that we have recently produced and the generation that's going to come after that care about that stuff. What they care about is they care about their Instagram likes and they care about their bank balance. And if I was them, I'd probably think exactly the same. But this this Australia New Zealand one day series for anyone who actually doesn't understand the history, go back to 1981. And look at a guy called Trevor Chappell, bowl and underarm ball, mm. which changed the whole face of world cricket at that time. That is what this was born of. But that's now 40 years in the distance, mate. Yeah. We're old boomers and no one cares about that stuff anymore. No, but Marty, what I- they care about is whether Kane Williamson is playing for the Hyderabad Sun fannies or whatever the hell they're called, and, and he gets 600,000 mm. followers on his Instagram. Or but his, but yeah. I think cricket's in real trouble. I genuinely do. I mean, I think test cricket will survive in Australia because they do have the ashes and that, and they've got such sport. a rich history there when it comes to it. But you, you've even got to wonder, no one cares about one-day cricket anymore outside of the World outside Cup. The World no Cup, one's really caring about no. T20 cricket anymore no. well, because it's, it's just a franchise and sport, mate, yeah. And so you go, wow, one of the big sports. And so for New Zealand, who doesn't have the ashes, we always get the minnows playing here. Now on Spark Sports, so, you know, New Zealand cricket took the money and thought, well, hang on a minute, who's actually watching who's this watching? now? And Although again, this series all these, is on Sky, mate. That's and all the these other sports that have now been brought into our living room, then you have things like Commonwealth Games and you see people doing well in all these other sports. Well, that mountain biking looks good and all these. And you think to yourself, boy, you guys have been arrogant for a long time. You were the t- you've got the players' associations for both cricket and rugby where the tail's wagging the dog, thinking, hey, we've got this. Look at us. Look how arrogant. It's all about me, me, me. It's all about me, me, me. Yes, it's all about you, 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 until people stop caring. And then suddenly, there is actually no market here. So be careful what you wish for. Let us talk finally about the VAR and the VAR rulings, which, again, have just caused major consternation in Premier League football over the weekend. And it comes back again to the same arguments. And this is the frustrating thing. I mean, we can sit here week after week and we can argue about it. We bring up the same things because the same things are happening. But this is all part of it as well, because the way that these sports organisations operate, they want us to be boring. They want us to keep ta- talking about stuff that people will go, I-, I don't care about that. I'm turning off that now. I don't want... But somebody He's got to bang the drum because the Warriors, you are frauds. Okay, that New Zealand rugby, that you are have cocked up the sport. Somebody's got to keep saying this. The VAR, it was introduced supposedly to get decisions hey, so, right. So, sorry, and yet now sorry. women's rugby in St Kennigan's College thriving. But, yeah, okay, let's get the VAR is, was brought in like the TMO to solve the riddle of human error when it comes to crucial decisions in sport. And all it's doing is actually complicating things much further. And we saw that on the weekend. Surely the the logic suggests you've got officials with eyes, whistles, legs, arms, brains. They're on the field. It's their call. If if they make a call, it's only them that should actually decide at the, what for whatever reason that they need to go and check something. Unless it's foul play, unless it's an obvious incident that is off the ball that they don't actually see, or it's a, a blatant handball in the penalty area or an offside. I don't see why a referee should run over and start looking five minutes ago at a foul on the field or something like that. It is just wrecking what was the most beautiful game in the world. Look, I agree. I think the biggest problem with rugby is how often do you have a game of rugby where the next day we're not talking about the result, we're talking about the referee. Every, every game and almost. I always defend the referees because I believe it's a game that's rules are too open to interpretation. And so you're always going to get a different read. Football's not that way. There's a reason why football is the global game because it's got a really easy, clear, simple set of rules. It's a low cost of entry and anybody can play it pretty much anywhere. And as you said, now they've started to come in and complicate it. What we're actually doing now is we're getting the rugby model. We're not talking about Leeds victory or Leeds loss over the weekend. We're not talking necessarily about Arsenal, Manchester United in terms of the great goal and the turnaround on the team's fortunes. We're just discussing the controversies of the VAR. And that's not what sport's all about. Yes, there's always going to be human error. We get that. And you'd like to think throughout a season it all comes out on the wash. But there's nothing worse having technology. And we there at home can see what the technology should be suggesting, only to have then to be told otherwise. And you go, what am I missing what here? Am I, what, what am I, am I missing, missing here? here? I'm seeing what you're looking at. Yeah. And, 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 you, you're, and you're getting something. Your brain's telling you those pictures because mean Because you've this. got so much information in your head that you can't simplify it now because you're looking at it laterally and you're looking at... You know, if you've got too much information, what is it? Par- paralysis by analysis. over-analysis? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, are we going to talk about the Barrett brothers? What we're going to talk about is, before we go, the final word that you're going to say is, I enjoyed the All Blacks win over Argentina. Repeat it after me. I... I enjoyed, enjoyed the All Blacks. The um, All Blacks. Win over Argentina. Win over Argentina. That's all we need. But, but... That's all we need. What about the Barretts? 
Devlin. I don't do if, ups, and maybes. I do absolutes. Do you know what I'm trying to say? The Platform.